Hi, Jaden and Haley. Um, this is Steve Aldrich. I'm an assistant professor of geography in the Department of Earth and Environmental Systems at Indiana State University. And part of my job involves researching deforestation in the Amazon. Um, so I'm here to answer a couple of your questions that you emailed me um, about deforestation in the Amazon. And the first one is, how is deforestation affecting oxygen levels and by how much? Um, I don't actually know by how much, but the, say, percentage change is probably pretty low. And the reason for this is the way that pl all photosynthesizing organisms work. So if you remember, um, photosynthesis is the process by which the sun's energy and carbon dioxide are combined within the plant cell structures um, to store carbohydrates in the plant's tissues, basically to grow a plant. And then uh, what we always forget about when we learn about photosynthesis is that plants respirate, they breathe just like you and I. And so during the sunny parts of the day, when the sun's energy is striking the plant's leaves, the chlorophyll, the special cells that photosynthesize the sun's energy, it's pulling in carbon dioxide and the energy from the sun and storing uh, carbon and releasing oxygen as a byproduct. But at night, when the sun goes down, plants uh, use oxygen to break apart those carbohydrates and basically eat and release CO2. So, um, you know, on the balance, plants do release more oxygen than they consume. Um, but overall, uh, it's not like cutting down the trees in the Amazon is going to deplete our oxygen to any significant degree. The bigger problem, though, is that when, you, when plants photosynthesize, when a tree grows, it stores quite a bit of carbon. Through this photosynthesis process, it pulls in carbon dioxide, right, and the sun's energy, and it builds cells from that. And, when, and those cells are, are locked up for a long period of time in the tree. And so the, the question in deforestation uh, in general is how much CO2 that's contributing. And remember that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. It contributes to climate change. Um, and also, uh, you know, we release so much of it that it could be, it's quite likely, in fact, that human behaviors like using fossil fuels and cutting down large forests um, could really mess up our climate system. It probably already has. Uh, your second question is, is um, ranching in the Amazon beneficial for farmers or cows, right, or cattle? And the, the answer to this is that, uh, yes, it's beneficial for both, uh, although cows are probably not the happiest in the Amazon when compared with other places. So cattle are, are probably um, best suited to natural grasslands, and the Amazon, if you, as you know, is a natural forest. So raising cattle in a place that used to be a forest can be problematic, especially when that forest is hot and wet, um, which the Amazon definitely is. So a uh, hot and wet forest uh, is a great place to, uh, for a cow to develop some health issues. And one of those big health issues that concerns the world with cattle ranching the Amazon is hoof and mouth disease, um, which can affect human beings. Luckily, uh, we were pretty good at keeping away from it. But in the Amazon, that hot and wet conditions really leads to, to problems. And while you can vaccinate cattle against it, um, that has been a, a spotty practice at best. Although now, uh, in the last two years or so, the Brazilian government has really stepped up vaccination programs and doesn't have as much of a problem with um, hoof and mouth disease or febre aftosa, as they say in Portuguese, um, as, as, as much as they used to. Uh, but really, the real folks who are getting the benefits are the, the ranchers. And the ranchers make quite a bit of money ranching. Um, in terms of economic strategies, you've got like basically four, um, four main strategies in the Amazon. One, you can mine minerals. And so some of the largest bauxite mines, we use bauxite to make aluminum, uh, exists in the Amazon. We also have very large uh, iron ore mines and lots of gold, believe it or not. Um, two, you can raise crops, crops like soybeans or um, uh, let's see, bananas, lots of different crops, cacao, which we make chocolate from, all sorts of stuff like that, right? Uh, three, 
you can um, you can ranch cattle, and cattle ranching is a very very uh, viable, uh, very cost effective way to make money. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in a second. And then uh, four, you can cut down trees and logging is illegal in most cases in the Amazon, although that's changed a little bit over the last couple of years as the Brazilian government has loosened up some of its environmental protection laws through a new forest code. Um, cattle ranching, that's still pretty pretty profitable. In fact, some cows from the Amazon are sent alive all the way to the Middle East for halal processing. It's a very, very lucrative industry. Um, so that one still fits. And large ranching and um, uh, mining, or I'm sorry, large plantation agriculture and, and mining are very viable economic strategies. But cattle ranching might be king economically, especially in places where soybeans can't be grown. Um, so in other words, cattle ranching in the Amazon really benefits farmers most. Uh, ranchers are very wealthy uh, individuals for their region. Okay. Uh, the third question is, have I been to the Amazon and, and what is it like? Um, I've been to the Amazon many times. I go pretty much once a year for about a month, uh, usually during the summer when I'm between class sessions and I can spend a big chunk of time doing research. Um, I've, but I've been going uh, since 2003 every year. My first trip was in 1997. And, uh, you know, the Amazon is an incredibly diverse very different place. I mean, things are different from one end of it to the other. Um, but some general characteristics are that there's water everywhere except for where there isn't. So people, um, and that's true everywhere, right? Uh, but people think of the Amazon as like the river, and that's a big part of the Amazon basin. But uh, actually more of the Amazon basin is upland areas. And these upland areas can get very dry. In fact, a big chunk of the Amazon has a very distinct dry season where things are drier probably than the, uh, you know, kind of the driest parts of, um, say, our summers here in the Midwest. Um, you know, it's, it gets very dry. Uh, of course, then the rest of the year, it's like a monsoon. It's raining all the time. Um, food varies all over the place. It's delicious. It often involves either beef, because we've got all these cows being grown. Um, remember, 80%, over 80% of the deforested land in the Amazon is dedicated to ranching at this point. Um, it eventually ends up as ranches. Um, or fish, because fish grow in, uh, very well in the Amazon, um, and some of them are really tasty. Uh, really tasty, in fact. Uh, it's one of the my favorite things about going to the Amazon is the food. Um, of course, the other part is the people. Uh, the Amazon is like the rest of Brazil in that there's been lots of cultural, racial, and, and uh, kind of political mixing. And so the perspectives and kind of characteristics of folks in the Amazon are, are really unique. It's a cool place to go. Uh, but it's, you know, some other things that kind of shock people when they first go there. It's flat. Uh, very flat, in fact, um, much flatter than people envision, um, and it is hot, 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 hot. It's always at least 80, pretty much, um, hot and humid. All right, um, your fourth question is, what's the biggest problem with deforestation? And, you know, that's a hard one to answer, actually, because there are a lot of big problems. One, of course, is what I mentioned before, the contribution of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere could be, uh, is not just could be, very highly, highly, almost certainly um, affecting our climate. Uh, so that's a big problem. Another big problem is habitat fragmentation. So you cut down a forest, a big chunk of forest, and you remove all the place, all the places where plants or animals in particular are able to live and survive. So that's a huge problem. Another problem is that it takes a long time for these landscapes to recover. Um, we've actually haven't been able to do any experiments for how long this takes in the Amazon, uh, but the thinking is up to 600 years once you cut down a, a chunk of forest for it to develop back into a, kind of an environment that is of equal diversity and function uh, to the environment that you cut down and that you removed. So there are kind of three big problems that I see with deforestation, and that's uh, the first is, you know, Carbon dioxide emissions, they go up massively when you cut down a forest. 
Um, they contribute massively. Uh, two is habitat fragmentation and loss. And then three is the length of time to recovery. Um, there are other issues too, but they kind of fall into another question here that you have. Um, five, is there anything we can do to help stop it? Uh, that's tough. International pressure on Brazil and other Amazonian countries like Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Bolivia helps. Um, but really, you know, it's tough because when we look at our own history here in the United States, um, we cut down, um, you know, probably 90% of our forests, at least 80% of our forests in our race to develop into one of the world's most wealthy nations. Um, and when you say to a Brazilian, hey, you guys need to stop cutting down the, the Amazon, um, the response can be sometimes, well, you guys did it and it worked well for you, so why can't we? Um, but we, so we can help by uh, pressuring, you know, kind of keeping this as an issue in the forefront of people's minds. Uh, another thing we can do is be savvy consumers. So we want to make sure that we're not buying products that come from the Amazon that may have been harvested illegally. Um, in terms of wood products, that's that's pretty easy to do because most of the large, um, you know, home improvement chains have really, uh, even a decade ago, more than a decade ago, promised that they wouldn't sell products from tropical rainforests. Um, but there are other products out there that you might not be aware of that come from these places. Um, you know, some cosmetic products might. You got to be careful about you know, a savvy consumer. Be careful about what you buy. Uh, another thing you can do is there are organizations out there that work to um, help agriculturalists in the Amazon and elsewhere in Latin America um, be good stewards of their environment. And so, if you have financial resources, you can donate to those. Um, you know, Heifer International is a good one. Um, and there, there are others too. The uh, C4, C-I-F-O-R, is another place that can guide you to good organizations that help people. Uh, C-I-F-O-R dot org, I believe. Um, so, but those are really the big things. Um, you know, if you have a lot of money available to you, you could go buy huge chunks of the Amazon. But, um, you know, good luck to you in that endeavor. <laughs> Um, interesting things I found in the Amazon. The Amazon has an incredible history. Uh, people forget that you know some Confederate soldiers uh, right at the end of the Civil War, the United States Civil War, actually went to try to establish a Confederate Republic in the Amazon. The Ford Motor Company started two rubber plantations in the Amazon. Uh, so its history is kind of crazy. Um, interesting. Other interesting things. I mean, I've seen some pretty interesting birds and wildlife. Um, interesting foods. I've eaten alligator there. I've had piranha many times. It's actually really tasty. Fry it up. It's good. Um, some of the most beautiful beaches I've ever been to, um, and you know, I've been to the Caribbean. I've been to the Indian Ocean. I've been to Thailand. Um, some of the most beautiful beaches in the world I've ever seen are in, in the Amazon, actually. Uh, El Terre du Chão is a beach that you should check out if you search online uh, for some pictures. It's A-L-T-E-R-D-O, would be the second word, do, uh, chao, C-H-A-O, is uh, it's a white sand beach in the middle of the Amazon near the city of Santarén. It's very, very nice. Um, so those are pretty interesting. Other interesting things, um, you know, Brazilians are especially, and I'm talking about Brazil mostly because that's where I have the most experience, uh, Brazilians are really resourceful folks, and so some of the strategies to eke out a living from a very harsh environment, the Amazon's not an easy place to live, are pretty amazing. And so to see how people um, live and live comfortably in some cases has been pretty interesting. All right. Uh, question seven, when people clear land for farming, does the land have better soil? Um, and then kind of a subset of that, if it doesn't have good soil, why do you think people keep clearing land and then can't they just realize things don't grow very well on it and stop? Uh, this is a good question. And so when we clear land for farming uh, in the Amazon, the soil doesn't really change immediately. Um, overall, soil fertility in the Amazon is poor. Uh, the soils are very old and they're what we call highly weathered. In other words, um, lots of rainfall over time has really washed the nutrients to lower profiles or lower locations in the soil. So you can think of if all the nutrients are on the top from all the leaves and stuff that fall from the trees, they kind of rot a little bit. 
and they contribute nutrients back into the soil. The, um, those nutrients, when water falls on top of them, they kind of wash through the soil, almost like if you pour, uh, I don't know, like some food dye on the top of your sand, uh, sand in a sandbox and then dump a bucket of water on top, the food dye would move through the sand, right? The food coloring would move through the sand. Well, that's what happens with the nutrients in the Amazon. And since it rains so much, the nutrients wash out pretty quickly, actually. Um, also, these soils are some of the oldest in the world. If we look at the geological history of soil structures in the Amazon, um, you know, if we look back, way, way back in time when uh, the Amazon, the South America was part of the African, you know, kind of combined with Africa into a single landmass and then it split off. Um, you know, these soils and the soils in the Congo Basin of um, Africa are some of the oldest in the world. And so they've seen most of their nutrients get washed down. Um, that said, the soil can support quite a bit of plant life if it's protected from that rain. And so this mature forests kind of protect the soil from the most, uh, most impactful rain that can wash those nutrients down. So when you have a established mature forest, the soils are actually protected and able to support quite a bit of life. But when you remove those forests, you expose the soils and that rainfall really does wash the nutrients down. So it's not that clearing makes the land better or worse, it's that it removes that protective layer and causes issues um, for farming. Uh, sorry, my computer keeps going to sleep, so I have to, uh, or at least shutting off and locking, so I have to keep unlocking it. Um, in terms of, uh, is the, if the soil's not good, and it really isn't in the Amazon with some minor exceptions, uh, there's a type of soil there called uh, teja preta, or dark earth soil. Uh, and this is an area of pretty intense, interesting research. These Amazon dark earths is another term that refers to them. They're uh, human-created soils, we think, and they're very fertile, but they're small areas around places where indigenous groups uh, probably settled in large numbers. Uh, but the bad, most of the soils in the Amazon aren't very good, and you know, you, you think, well, if the soils aren't very good, why do people keep clearing land? That's another part of this question. Uh, well, the answer to that is, if the soils aren't very good and only produce food or crops for 8 to 10 years, once you've exhausted the fertility of the land, what do you do? If you've got a lot of land around, which is the case in the Amazon, you just move to a new place. And so, actually, this low soil fertility is one cause of increased deforestation. People abuse the fertility of the land that they have. They don't have good soils uh, like, uh, you know, folks in Iowa do, for instance, um, they have kind of crappy soils. And so when they exhaust the fertility, they just move on to new soils, right? Especially because they don't have the money to apply uh, petrochemical fertilizers, you know, ammonium nitrate, etc., cetera, to, to boost the fertility of their soil. Um, and so they keep clearing land because they're searching for more and more fertile soils. Most folks in the Amazon realize this is a problem and they realize the soil's not so fertile and so they've adopted some techniques to make it fertile for a, a short period of time. And one of these is, you know, they'll cut down trees, they burn, they use fire quite a bit, they'll burn the land to return some of the nutrients to the soil, almost like natural fertilizer, um, but they run out of fertility pretty quickly and, and move on. Um, and so they don't stop because they need to produce food for their households or food for market, right, to make a profit to support themselves. So, you know, this poor soil thing, we could probably address by improving farming techniques in the Amazon um, or improving pasture management techniques. Uh, but, you know, these things take time and, and effort, and uh, the Amazon is a very difficult place to move around in. The roads are poor. Um, and so if you don't have assistance in learning how these new techniques, it can be very tough as a farmer or an agriculturalist to, to maintain soil fertility. And so an option is to move on and deforce more. Your eighth question here is uh, when they use the Amazon for animals, um, they have gates and things that keep them together. Um, let me read the question here just for a second. I can't pause the recording, unfortunately.
I, you know, with question eight, uh, in terms of animals getting killed and, and gates and fences, um, really, uh, in most of the cattle ranching areas, because this really deals with cattle uh, for the most part, with cattle ranching animals, we don't have in the Amazon as much of a problem with predation as we might in the American West, where we've reintroduced mountain lions and wolves, and they're doing very well. And they do take a certain number of farmers' animals. In the Amazon, um, you know, in the, especially in the intensive ranching areas, there aren't so many predators left. There aren't so many jaguars or panthers or whatever uh, to take these animals. And so the real threat to these animals' safety is disease, which I mentioned before, or people. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I research is the connection between land conflict, people arguing over land rights, and deforestation. And, and you know, when there's conflict, deforestation is increased uh, for a lot of different reasons. And I could talk for hours about that. But uh, one of the things that happens in these conflicts is that people will kill each other's cows. And they do that because either they want to eat the cow, because <laughs> it's delicious, uh, or and they need food, or they're doing it because the cow is a significant asset and it can hurt a rival to lose these cows. So, you know, maybe I misunderstand the question a bit, but um, they do keep animals pretty well contained in most of the places where ranching occurs. It's not like people are running into them with trucks or uh, predators are taking them to any large degree. It's more disease and other humans that are a threat to animals. Okay, so question nine is, if you can't farm or have animals, then what do you do, right? What's the point of living in the Amazon if you can't farm or raise animals? Um, and, you know, here I would say that we can raise cattle um, on already deforested areas pretty efficiently if we use modern techniques. And so this is one of the things that um, when I speak with cattle ranchers, I encourage them to do is look at some of the more modern pasture management techniques make sure that they're very carefully maintaining cattle stocking densities, in other words, how many animals they put in a given pasture, to make sure that they don't overgraze the, 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 the environment that they have there. Another thing that they can do is, is manage their land better, not use fire as a pasture management technique because it leads to pest plants, weeds essentially growing more, um, and using instead some chemical inputs that in a reasonable manner that can um, extend the fertility of their um, cattle pastures, right? Um, in other words, you know, cattle ranching is going to stay in the Amazon. The goal, instead of banning it or eliminating it, should be to make it more productive so that we don't need to cut down more land to raise the beef that the Brazilian cow, uh, beef market demands and that external markets to Brazil demand too. In other words, we need to intensify rather than extensify. Intensify means produce more cows on the same amount of land rather than make more pasture land available so we can produce more cows, right? In the U.S., we've done that quite a bit. We've intensified by the use of confined animal feeding operations, CAFOs, uh, which, you know, you can see if you head out to, like, say, the Front Range of the Rockies in Colorado. And, you know, there are huge environmental problems with confined animal feeding operations as well. Um, you know, cows in these environments eat a lot and poop a lot, and that poop is a huge environmental problem, right? But, uh, you know, we're talking about Amazon deforestation. One way that you could eliminate or, or at least limit uh, deforestation would be to intensify animal production in the Amazon or switch to other types of animals. Capybara, for instance. Check it out on Wikipedia. C-A-P-Y-B-A-R-A. Uh, -A. Uh, basically, it's a big rodent, and some people are saying, well, if we raise these, they're more sustainable and reasonable um, and for environmentally speaking, and they taste pretty good. I've eaten some, uh, but it's like eating a big rat. Uh, my cat's here to say hello. Um, anyway, the last question you have is thoughts about logger rights. And this is an interesting issue um, because, you know, laws in Brazil are either or about that you can't cut down about 50% of the forest on your land. So if you have 100 acres, you can only cut down 50, 50 acres of forest. And that kind of constitutes somebody saying, hey, you own the land, but you can't do something with it, right? 
And uh, you know that, in the parlance of environmental economics, we call that a taking. Someone's taking my land rights away. And so this is a hard thing to strike, uh, strike a balance between this is private property and the owner can do with, do with it what they will, and this is a collective need to not cut down all the forest. And so what I would say is that logging rights should really revolve around logging management plans, sustainable logging management plans, where we plan for long-term harvesting. Here in the U.S., in Canada, and in European uh, timber markets, we do that. We realize that we need, say, 30 years to grow paper trees, trees that we can turn into paper, so we make sure that we're managing our land in a way that can produce paper relatively sustainably. And so that's kind of been a change that's happened over the last 50 years in North America and Europe. And that's where, you know, logging companies in the Amazon could probably do better. Actually, not just probably, they definitely could do better. And it would be better for them in the long term, economically speaking. Um, that said, logging is a very contentious issue in the Amazon. Many times the big loggers are very violent people. They protect their interests um, extra legally. In other words, they can, uh, you know, disappear people or use intimidation to get their way. Um, I've actually experienced this directly. Uh, one time I was on the Trans-Amazon near a town called Uruara. Uh, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. I was interviewing small farmers driving down a, a settlement road called the Travesson. It's a, just a dirt road, basically a mud road. And uh, I was with a group of people, a group of researchers. We were working with um, some students from a university, um, collecting data from uh, about 800 people. So big survey effort. And uh, we wanted to know about their agricultural practices. But along the way, we're driving and we come across a logging truck stuck in the mud. Um, no one was around. So we get out and we're kind of checking things out. And uh, suddenly, up drives from both directions more trucks and they surround us and they demanded to know what we were doing there and these were these were guys that were illegally logging and they were worried that we were law enforcement officials because we were driving in kind of kind of uh, official looking white trucks um, and they were worried that we were from IBAMA the Environmental Protection Agency um, the Federal Environmental Protection Agency and we were there to find them for illegal logging um, it took us a little while to actually convince them that we were not there to, uh, you know, arrest them or find them, um, and that we instead were pretty harmless academic researchers. Um, you know, this is a this is an issue. Sometimes logging companies will show up in a remote area, and basically take over the town. They eliminate uh, kind of many many stories of a, a sawmill operator showing up, promising all kinds of development, new schools, new roads, etc. Um, but then limit, uh, eliminating or limiting the import of other stuff from outside the town. Uh, you have to buy everything through the sawmill store, uh, essentially locking down the, the town into a company town where everything costs more and none of the benefits that were promised ever arrive. So, you know, logging rights are an issue um, and can be improved on both sides of the coin, both loggers and those affected by their actions, right? Well, if you have any other questions that uh, these sort of answers maybe help prompt, uh, feel free to shoot me an email and I'll try to get an answer to you as soon as I can. Um, and good luck. Uh, I hope things are going well for you.